me check my volume. All right. You're all set. You're all set. How are you, Kate? I'm good. I uh, am new to Skype. I mean, I'm old new, so. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Welcome to the Noble Pen Podcast. I appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. First off, tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you get started writing? Um, well, I am 50 years old. I live in the Pacific Northwest, and I've been pretty much writing my entire life. Okay. Um, I started as a reader, obviously. Um, right. And then um, just little little stories here and there. My grandfather was a writer, but not a writer of fiction. He was. Um, he wrote like books about biology and chemistry and things like that. And I okay. always loved seeing his books on our bookshelf. And so there was a part of me that always wanted to see my book on a bookshelf somewhere. So it's always so that's been, where you got your inspiration. Yeah, for sure. Even though um, okay. definitely not a science minded person <laughs> like well, he was. That's OK. All right. Tell us about uh, what genre do you like to write in or are you multi genre? I am. I'm multi-genre. So I, my first novel that I started um, like in 2004, okay. um, I knew I wanted to have elements of mystery to it, but by the time that I was done with it, it was kind of a jumble of genres. And so it took me some time to kind of figure out where it belonged. And it took a lot of editing, like a third of the manuscript to oh, get wow. it down to, yeah, to get it down to, um, what's now considered I'm being marketed as a cozy mystery. I'm probably a little more soft boiled. Um, and then I also, can you describe uh, that for us? What does soft boiled mean as opposed to a cozy mystery? So a little bit, a little more on the light end of that then. Uh, so soft boiled, there's basically there's cozy, there's soft boiled, there's hard boiled, and then there's thriller suspense. And, um, okay. so your hard boiled would be like your, um, Sam Spade, you know, like the, your okay. traditional, whatever. Um, so I, I didn't write the book initially as a cozy. And so when some of the publishers that were looking for cozies were reading it, they were like, mm, it's not quite cozy enough. So there's okay. some things that are, um, it's fairly cozy, but it's just a little bit on the other edge of that. Um, but while I was so cozy in the sense of like, you mean you're setting like like a, a beautiful town that people would want to visit or. Yes. So uh, the typical cozy mystery would be um, a small town. You've got a, a community of people that your protagonist is engaging with on a regular basis. Kind of like uh, a Gilmore Girls type deal. You ever seen that show? I, I like a have... Stars Hollow. I have seen that. So that's that's kind of the idea. Um, I would say I'm trying to think of um, it's just not going to be your big city. It's going to be um, some there's typically once you are um, in cozy, you're not going to be in cities. Um, right. OK, but so while I was uh, working on that book, which had its it's lived many, many lives. Um, I ended up writing a middle grade adventure book based, um, kind of inspired by my now 17 year old son who was really into Bigfoot, finding Bigfoot, the show, things like that. And so after I got my agent for my mystery novel, I had an opportunity to submit that to her as well. And that actually was the series that I got the first contract on and is the first book that has come out. Um, oh, wow. The other, so my mystery um, book, one of the series of my mystery novels is coming out in July and book one of my. Do you mind sharing book, the name of that with us? So, so the reader, so the viewers can, can know that. Okay. Yes. So it's called the Sasquatch of Hawthorne Elementary. Oh, that's awesome. You yeah. know, I, I'm not going to lie. I think I've seen a, at least a cover that looks similar to that or that cover recently. Have you shared that before? I have. Yes. Because OK, I thought I seen that. Yeah, that looks really cool. Yeah, it was it was originally supposed to come out in November. Um, okay. And then because of supply chain issues, they pushed it back to January and then it ended up coming in um, on time. And so Amazon started sending copies out. In fact, some of my 
pre-orders got their copies before I'd even gotten mine um, oh, from wow. my publisher yet. So um, it is available for purchase, but it's technically not coming out till January. But so I am, I have a foot in both worlds. I am a middle grade adventure author yeah. and I am a mystery author as well. That's pretty cool. All right. Tell us a little bit. I mean, don't give too much away, obviously, but tell us a little bit about Sasquatch. What's it about? What? Give us a little bit of the character, a little bit of the background, whatever you're willing to share. Sure. So um, my protagonist, his name is Jake. He's 12 years old and he has lived his entire life in Orlando, Florida. His mother had left Washington State to go be a Disney princess at, at Disney World. <laughs> And then when she got pregnant with him, she realized that she needed to have a more stable job. And so she ended up coming, they moved back uh, to Washington State. They're staying with his grandfather. And his grandfather had once told him a story about a Sasquatch encounter on the Olympic Peninsula, which I don't know if you know this area at all, but it's- By Washington? Um, yes. Okay. Olympic Peninsula is- um, kind of the area where the vampires and werewolves were in twilight. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So it's very, as we like to say in our house, squatchy over there. There's um, the Olympic National Forest, lots of trees, mountains. It's very remote. It's not, you know, so there's, there's a lot Sounds of- Sounds like my kind of place. Yes. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. There's a place called Hurricane Ridge where you can just, you can see all the way to uh, Victoria, Canada. It's pretty oh, cool. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, um, so anyways, Jake uh, is, he, he's never known his dad and he wants his dad to, he wants to be in a relationship with him. And so he figures that if he can prove the existence of Bigfoot, that he'll become TikTok famous and his, his dad, dad will come and find not. him. And so he gets hired by one of his new classmates at, at his new school to, um, to try and figure out what she saw in the woods across the street from the elementary school. And so he starts to do an investigation and she, he originally she's his client, but she's kind of bossy. So she ends up as, as his partner along with another little boy who, um, who is kind of their and little mascot. Those are the three that we see on the cover, correct? Yes. Those are the okay. three on the cover. Yep. So it's Jake, Jasmine and Lanny, and they are going out into the woods of the Pacific Northwest to, Look for evidence of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. That's awesome. That sounds like a really good book. I'm, I might have to pick that up, actually. <laughs> um, let me ask you this. This is a new question I'm adding to the show, like kind of like an exclusive content type. Exclusive content. Deal. Okay. Now, what is something about your main character? I, I'm sorry, what was his name? Jake. Jake. What is something about Jake that only you would know that you hope people figure out through reading the book. D does that make any sense? Like what is one thing that you, you put in there, but didn't actually write it that you hope people figure out about that character? That's a tough one on, on that series. I actually had a thought about that. Um, I have some Easter eggs in my adult mystery that I just finished uh, sending that off to my, to my editor. Um, so that was okay. kind of on my mind with, with that. Like book. I said, whatever you're willing to share is fine. <laughs> well, Try I don't to want to give information out there for you. Just in case, uh, so I want to see if anybody, anybody figures it out. But in terms of Jake, um, geez, there's, there's something personal that I put in there that, that maybe only my family would know about. Does that count? <laughs> That'll work. That's exclusive enough to me. Right. So, um, so Jake never talks about his middle name, but his middle initial is Q. And um, when I was a little girl, so my grandmother's maiden name was Quinn. And she um, always talked to me about how she loved the Ramona Quimby books, um, which Ramona, Beezus, all of those. Do you know those books? Okay. No, I, were, I don't know any authors yet. <laughs> I only know like a few mainstream guys until I start reading more. Right. So Beverly Cleary was a very famous children's author and she wrote middle grade fiction. Um, she was kind of, uh, so she just recently passed away. She was over a hundred years old. Um, oh, wow. When I was growing up, it was Beverly Cleary and Judy Bloom. So you kind of graduated from Beverly Cleary up to Judy Bloom because Judy Bloom was a little racier. <laughs> um, 
But so yeah. Beverly Cleary, her her character, Ramona Quimby, her last name started with a Q. And my grandmother always told me that she connected with this little girl because she struggled to write the Q in her middle name. And so it was really important to me when I wrote my middle grade fiction novel to include something that was sentimental to me and that really, you know, started with my love of reading and um, my connection with my grandmother. And so I purposely Actually, really put cool. that in there. I really, I really appreciate that. Is um, You said that the book is kind of based around your son a little bit, your 17 year old son, correct? Yes, it, he wasn't 17 at the time. <laughs> oh, okay. He was little uh, at the time that I started writing it. Hey, everybody believes in Sasquatch at different times of their <laughs> life. I Hey, I, I believe it could happen, to be honest with you. Anything you can think of nowadays seems like it, it, it could be out there. Who knows? Yes. I leave right? the question open-ended, just so you know. In every book, there's no definitive yes or no in anything right. that we do. So... Okay. Okay. Leave it up to interpretation. With the name Zach, is that your son's name or is that just a name you came up with for the book? Uh, Jake. Or Jake. I'm sorry, yes. Jake. Um, no. So <laughs> Jake Nelson is the character's name. And that used to be my son's, um, his, he'd have a pseudonym when he was doing, had it had, um, was playing with his friends, he would pretend to be Jake Nelson because he had a boy in his class that he thought was really cool whose name was Jack Nelson. And I oh, was like, okay. so it's Jake and Jack Nelson. And so um, that was part of the reason why I chose Jake was because he was like, you know, my buddy Jack Nelson and I, Jake Nelson, are going to go out and do something. So. Okay. Okay. How do you go about your writing style? How do you think of your characters' personalities? How do you do the setting? Are you are you very descriptive with your setting? Are you a little bit laid back and focus a little more on the characters? So the very first time that I put my work in front of an editor, it was a friend of mine who was um, starting a, an editing business. And okay. it, was, it was the first time that I was like, okay, I'm going to put this up for critique and see what happens and see if I actually pass out from this or if I survive this experience. Because one of the things about becoming a writer is learning to take criticism and getting okay. a thicker skin. And that was not my strong suit. So when I um, put my work with her, um, she, um, her, the first thing she said was, you are phenomenal with dialogue but I feel like your characters are standing in a white room with white carpet, white walls. She goes, you're just not describing. Not descriptive enough. Yeah. And so, okay. and of course she was much more into literary fiction and with cozy mystery, you don't need to be super descriptive and same with middle grade. But um, I, I started paying more attention. She's like, I want you to go sit someplace and I want you to observe. Like she had me go sit in the middle of our um, my hometown, she had we had had coffee, and she's like, "I want you to go over there, and I want you to sit on that bench and look around, and I want you to write down everything you see." And oh. so that was one of the exercises that she gave me to really start getting me to think about setting. Um, part of it is that I, the way that my brain works is, I think about a human interacting with another human and what do I want that interaction to be? And I don't necessarily pay attention to what's going on around me, but as right. I have been working on it more, I've become more descriptive. And also as, as I've moved from being a pantser to a planter, I'm still not completely a plotter, but I, I do a lot more plotting than I used to. Okay. Um, that once I've got that story structure in place, then I can start to go, okay, now what does I, what do I want this room to look like? What do I want it to smell like? What do I want these people to be experiencing? And then, and then from there, you know, obviously that's just with the scene setting characters. I feel like really characters drive the plot of most things. So All I've right. been also learning on the other hand, character development and then how that fits in. Okay, and how, where do you get your inspiration for character development? Is that just something that you just kind of think of yourself, or do you kind of base it off of characters that you like from maybe things that you've written before, or maybe movies you like? No, I definitely am paying attention to the people around me. So sorry oh. to anybody who recognizes anything about themselves, because I'm like, I'm the, in fact, I had, I warned somebody once, I'm like, I'm just telling you, I'm a writer, so... Yeah. Whatever, 
you may end up an uh, inspiration for a character in my book and they stop talking to me. <laughs> so, you know, like some people- That's don't not a reason to stop talking to somebody. <laughs> You never know. People are weird that way, but um, yeah. no, I pay I pay attention to the people around me. I'm trying to learn about human. I don't know just how humans move throughout their lives and how they mm -hmm. interact with each other, and really starting to understand why what motivates people to do what they do. Because really, that's one of the things that I think. Um, makes a really great story or series or TV show or whatever compelling. Yeah. Like I think about Monk, right? I'm a big fan of Monk. Okay. TV show. I've never seen it. I've heard about it. Oh, you should definitely watch it. So what, the what great, streaming service is it on? Um, I'm trying to think, I feel like it might be on Peacock right now, but it's, um, oh. it's oftentimes on uh, regular TV too. You can oh, usually okay. find episodes. Like I but, said, I've strolled past it. I've, I don't really know what a monk really is. I know it's something religious. <laughs> no, not this show. No, that's his last name. So he oh, is, okay. he's a detective and he's kind of a, if you took Sherlock Holmes and then you exacerbated his neuroses, that's where you get monk. And he's, oh, that's cool. so because of his issues and because of the driving factor of his motivation, which is his wife was killed. The love of his life was killed. And the entire series is him trying to solve that. It's the one unsolvable case. So you've okay. got, here's all of his neuroses and his OCD and, and all of the things about him and trying to find the humanity in those things while he's also trying to pursue this life altering, you know, goal of solving this murder. And so I, I am starting to learn a little bit more about how to really let your character and like you said sometimes there's things that are never written that um the author will know about their character right and those are, are the meant things to be that, assumed but right. we don't know who's going to figure that out and who isn't right and and i do like one of the things like so i've i've taken a few classes over the last couple of years um can you, about, can you describe those classes? I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but maybe oh, no, just to okay. help some viewers, you know what I mean? What classes can you take? You mean like creative writing classes or? Well, so there's a lot of online Zooms. One of the ones that I took was um, the woman who wrote Save the Cat Writes a Novel. So Save the Cat is a book by Blake Snyder, and okay. it's mostly for screenwriting. It's about um, the, the beats in a storyline that you should have to make a full story arc and then your character arcs kind of follow similar patterns. And she took that concept and she adapted it toward novel writing. So I did one of her seminars, you can do those online. Um, and then another one is Rachel Stevens has something called the plot embryo, which I'm not sure if she came up with the plot embryo herself or whether She's just kind of taken it and run with it. Yeah. But both of both of them have been really good about um, understanding your characters first and foremost, and then plotting out the story. And the with the characters, what you like, some of the activities they talk about is making them a music playlist so that you know what music do they like, what vibe do they have, like like oh, wow. sitting with your characters and really getting to know them as if they were a human being mm -hmm. and that way when they do something you either purposely are doing something that's in character for them or something that's out of character and that will then shift the plot but you know your character first and foremost so that when your audience reads it they go they would never do that something must be going on or oh yeah that's just like them isn't oh, that gosh, hilarious like that they always do that oh. so oh. that's those are kinds of the things that as i have been um really trying to absorb everything um, that's out there to learn about the craft of writing um, that has that's really awesome. become really important to me as a writer. To me, it sounds like you're well-versed. And well, I, I've I, talked to a few authors <laughs> thus far. I don't know how many episodes you've watched so far, but. I've watched a handful. I watched Jessica's earlier this afternoon. She was great. Oh yeah, yeah, she was a great person. Just really fun personality she has. Very, very nice woman. And I followed her on Instagram after I saw that she's a cozy mystery writer. <laughs> oh, wow. That's pretty cool. All right. You know, I've seen, actually, I've seen a lot of that throughout the show so far. Like, I don't know if you've seen uh, M.T. O'Neill. I haven't yet. 
Well, it, he's on the list. He's I think maybe two or three back now. I'm not sure. Actually, he might have been right before Jessica, I think. But anyways, like he has gotten, a, he's he wrote me, he's gotten a lot of playback from the show as well too. So hopefully it works the same way for you. That's that's one of the general ideas of the show. The other idea I had is basically almost like a how-to. Like you're giving a lot of good information of what these other people can do. Like for instance, your setting. I would have never thought to actually go somewhere in, in real life. You know, I would just sit there and just try to like brainstorm it as opposed to maybe actually go walk through a park, look at what you're, pay attention to what you're looking at. That's that's great advice. I appreciate that. Right. Well, and funny, um, so initially the my mystery that's coming out in July was originally set in New Hampshire. I have okay. never set foot in the state of New Hampshire, but I've always been interested in New England. And so I've heard it's beautiful. Yes, I'm like, I'm going to write a book set in, in, in New England, and I picked New Hampshire. And so I would go on Google Earth, and I would drive the streets, and you can, you know, actually, like, explore, like, you're physically there, so that yeah. I could make descriptions of the, the setting and whatever. And then I went to a conference, and this um, agent was like, um, I like your work, but I just uh, signed a two New England mystery series last weekend. And so I went home. And I swapped it and moved it back to the Pacific Northwest and sent it back to them. And they're like, yeah, it's still not a fit for me, but good job. <laughs> so now my, my story is set completely back in the Pacific Northwest. But there are ways to, like, immerse yourself, even if you're not physically, like, able to walk out the door and right. be like, this is where my setting is. You can use Google Earth to explore areas and really get a feel for um, what it looks like. Yeah. Like, like, for instance, if you wanted to write something about England, per se, or something about, like, maybe something royal, maybe you could do that over there, too. That'd be cool. For sure. Well, and I, um, so book book two of my kids series, my middle grade series, um, mm -hmm. comes out in November. That one's set in the Cascade. Do you happen Mountains. to have a cover of that so you could show people? I, I can't show it yet. I just saw it for the first time today. I absolutely love oh, it. Oh, really? But, yeah, well, I just got cool. CP. That's a fun so, thing. It's not finished yet, but um, that book is set up in near a town called Leavenworth, Washington, which is a Bavarian town. The entire town has been made to look like a Bavarian village. Wow, um, really cool. But then book three is going to be set in Scotland, and I'm going to go there <laughs> so that I physically? can actually physically. Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going. I have a conference in York, England, and um, it's a mystery crime writers conference in okay. April. And I'm like, I got three days between that and another conference. So I'm going to take a train up to Scotland. And that way it'll actually hopefully have a really <laughs> genuine, authentic feel to it. Because that's really cool. I've heard of people like going to a cabin in the woods to write some type of woodsy kind of story. So that hopefully that really works out for you. I hope so too. But if it doesn't, at least I will have gone to Scotland. At least you have gone to Scotland. Right. <laughs> right. Actually, MT O'Neill is from Scotland, I believe. So oh, it's really? kind of weird to mention that. Yeah. I'll have to go check out that, that podcast. I missed that one. Oh, he's fantastic. He is absolutely fantastic. You got to watch him. I love him. Oh, for sure. Okay. Um, I have another question for you here. How do you go about your marketing or does your agent do that for you? So my agent doesn't do any marketing at all. My agent's job and my, my first of all, shout out to my agent because she has created a phenomenal. How did you find your agent? If you don't mind me asking, that's another good question right there because <laughs> a lot of people don't even know how to get an agent. Right. So, so she, um, it's the craziest story. I had been, uh, querying for probably, I want to say about nine months or so. And I went to a writer's a pitch conference, the one that I was just talking about where the guy yeah. had, had signed um, other New England books. Um, it's called New York Pitch Conference, and it's um, an opportunity to get your manuscript or your pitch in front of agents and publishers and one of our, one of, I have a dear group of friends as a result of that. We call ourselves the writing sisters. And that's cool. One of them did get an agent from, from that, um, that whole thing. But while I was there, one of the things that they said was before you show up, your homework is to go on publishers marketplace mm 
and look and see what books, uh, book deals are being announced. So Publishers Marketplace is a website where if uh, a deal is signed, uh, usually an agent or the publisher will put that up for everybody to see. So it'll say, you know, um, such and such book was so sold to such and such publishing house uh, represented by this person or whatever. And then it'll give a little blurb about the book. Right. And okay. we were supposed to go and look and see what was selling and what was how things were being pitched and marketed and things like that. And while I was looking, I saw the description for a cozy mystery series that had just sold. And I made I took a screenshot of it because it showed the agent that had had represented her. And then I forgot about it. And I went home and I had started querying my middle grade book. Um, with more uh, younger children's book publishers and had kind of set my other one aside because I hadn't, it had been a year and I hadn't gotten any bites. I'd had some full manuscript requests, but no, no signing. And so yeah. while I was working on that, I was like, you know what, I'm going to make one more pass at this. And I remembered that I had screenshot something. So I went and looked back through my pictures, found it, sent it to her and um she said uh there's some things that need to be fixed here revise it and resubmit it to me and so i did that i reached out to uh, to an editor did she today. did she give you the specifics or um yeah i mean there were definitely some pacing issues at the beginning of this can you book. explain pacing issues i'm sorry um so because it's a mystery you can't really slowly move your way into the mystery you can't do a lot of backstory you need to get into the heart of the the action and the story oh, within wow. the first couple of chapters i would say chapter three at the latest the murder should have taken place by chapter three at the latest and i was doing all the backstory is there always a murder then you're saying or um i mean with, with mine there's always going to be a murder but okay um, but so the, um, I, I'm the queen of info dumping. All of that information that, that your audience or your reader should never know about, but you know about, I would put into the book. And then they're like, no, that's all got to go. You can keep that in your back pocket so that you know all of these things, but that's all got to go. Or you've got to weave it through so that it's not just like your readers getting deluged with all this stuff. So that was, okay. that was, those were my pacing issues up front. I reached out to an editor that I'd worked with and she was like, here are some things that I think we need to work on. I revised the first three chapters, sent them to her and she signed me as a client. Yeah. And she has, um, she has created uh, an environment in which we have a private Facebook group. So all the authors are supporting each other. She does much more extensive work with preparing the manuscript to go out than some of my friends who have agents have had. Um, they usually, some of the agents like kind of presume that just the editor at the publishing house will do all that work, but you also got to get a, a publisher to want to buy your book. So, um, so my agent does not do that stuff. Okay. My um, publishing house, I have two different publishers. Um, I'm just kind of starting to move into that phase with my, uh, with Level Best Books, who are going to be putting out my mystery series. But okay. the um, uh, Raycraft Books, who's a imprint of, of Benchmark, thing. yeah, Benchmark Education. Raycraft Books, um, they have a, a PR department that we're, we're moving in certain directions with, um, but I have been trying, I've been doing the TikTok song and dance. I've been trying Facebook, Instagram. I agreed with what Jessica said that cozy mystery readers tend more likely to be on Facebook because you're yeah. often talking about an over 40 female demographic and they're more likely to be on Facebook. Um, so you do got to go where your audience is. Yeah, it makes um, sense. Yeah. And then with the middle grade, um, I, I came to the realization that I'm, I'm not marketing to middle grade kids. I'm marketing to middle grade parents because <laughs> those kids aren't going to necessarily be on my social media, my TikTok, anything like that. 
Um, and then I'm doing some boots on the ground stuff. Like I've gone to my local library. I've gone to local cool. schools. Um, I'm going to be going into some gift shops. This was a hint that somebody gave me um, that I think is a great idea that local gift shops love to support local authors. They're a great place to go to get your book, even more so than a local bookstore. Like a local bookstore, wow. um, you definitely want to connect with them. But a lot of times you'll have a gift shop in your, you know, in a smaller town or a local area, and they love to support local authors. And so I've got a list of places that I'm going to go in and show them my book and, and see what they what they think. But, yeah, there, it's it's a lot of times it's just like throwing things against the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah, I just had a TikTok go viral for something completely unrelated, and everything that I try to do gets 200 views. And this accidental TikTok in my pajamas got 150,000, 160,000 views. So there's just no rhyme or reason to any of it. Oh wow! So you can really drive yourself crazy trying to to solve it. Yeah, um, it, it it's it's definitely a tricky thing especially for those of us that are not natural marketers right right okay that's a fantastic answer i i i appreciate the in-depth um how do you process or deal with if you ever get them which i'm sure we all do how do you process and deal with negative reviews so i am new to this sphere the only other thing that i've had published was in an anthology um for Pensacola State College in Florida. My friend was editor of it and she was like, can you submit a short story? And I don't even know if there are reviews on that. So I never saw anything. Um, I, because my book is technically not out, I'm not like Amazon won't allow people to post reviews yet. And there's only a few arcs that are out there um, for, for the middle grade book. There is a review that was a Kirkus review that I accidentally happened upon um, on the Barnes and Noble website. And it was, it was tough. It was a tough read for me because it was the first time that I had um, read and I didn't ex know to expect it. I didn't know what the deal was with it. Yeah. And I, and I had to stop and think, okay, is this true? Is anything that they're saying true? Because some of the things that they said um, felt like they didn't get my book. They didn't understand my book. So one of the critiques that they made was that um, they thought it was just going to be about these kids hunting for Bigfoot and these adventures. But because there's this family dynamic story of, of the kid and trying to find figure out about his dad, yeah. um, that they, they felt like there, it was a, quote, bait and switch, that they it was more of a real human interaction story versus just about the adventure and, and the Bigfoot, which okay. I, I'd say is a valid critique if that's what you thought that it was going to be. But I never intended it to be that. So but you know what? I, Everybody's going to interpret your work their own way. If that's right. how they feel about it, don't worry about it. Pick up and move on from it. Right. Yeah. And and the other thing was that there there had been a comment um, that, that I had maybe been uh, stereotypical in some of the ethnic um representation which I the character that they're talking about is Indian American and my age or my editor is Indian American my beta reader is Indian American and so I I had to stop and go okay I don't know if that's true for them but but it's not true for these other people that I respect their opinions and I in right. my heart that was really important to me to get right so it sure, hurt sure. <laughs> but in terms of um, processing it I I asked my husband, my husband's been in the corporate world since he was 19 years old, how do you deal with setbacks? Because I was a stay-at-home mom for, I mean, my oldest kid is 28, so I started being a stay-at-home mom in 1994, and okay. I had never really had a career. This is my first time really putting myself out there. How yeah. do you process it? And he said, you're going to grieve it a little bit. You're going to try to sort truth from, from things that you know not to be true. And you're going to put your big girl panties on and then you're going to get back out there because that's 
going, you're going to encounter more of that. And every time you experience something like that, you take what you can to learn from it and then you just keep pressing forward. And so that's, that's where my head's got to be. Otherwise it, it would overwhelm me because this is, you know, this is your creative self putting yourself out there for the world. And then somebody's going, so you just can't let it change you. That's what it is. You can't let it change your drive. right? Right. For sure. Okay. Uh, how do you approach your chapter length? Because I've, I've talked to a few people. I don't know if you've heard this question in any of the other podcasts, but people seem to have a different perspective of this. I'm trying to get a generalistic idea of what people, you know, what what the median here is. Some people say a, a shorter chapter length because you, you want to get to the point, move on to the next thing. Some people say a longer chapter length. Do, do you think that that differs by genre or... I do. I absolutely do. Um, like there's a lot of aspects of genre that I'm starting to understand are, are very different. Um, for example, writing an adult mystery versus writing middle grade adventure. My editor said you were slowly getting, you know, weaving things through middle grade kids. They need to be smacked over the head. They need to be like, this is, this is what's happening. This is why it's happening. Like, they need things to be much more obvious. Okay. Um, and so in terms of chapter length, I do think with the middle grade, shorter is better. Mm-hmm. Um, it, in terms of mystery, I think shorter can be better um, for the most part. But I also agreed with Jessica about uh, you should be varying them. So there's going to be times when you just need a punch in the face chapter that's short to the point and then then something that kind of like, okay, so now that we've been through something, let's kind of see um, a little bit, let's slow the pace down a little bit. So there's going to be some ebb and flow to that. I feel like if it's very, very truncated, every single chapter is very short, it's going to read a little choppy, um, just like with your sentences, like you vary your sentences, you, you know, some sentences are going to be two words and some sentences are going to be whatever. Um, So I, I think too, that that with when I was listening to Jessica talk, I thought when I'm, I feel like when I get to the end of a chapter, I know I'm at the end of a chapter. Like, mm-hmm. like there's not a part of me that goes, should I keep writing here? Like, I just know, like it's time to move on to the next scene. Right. And I do struggle sometimes with like, do I have too many scenes in one chapter? Should that be a separate chapter? Or if I, if I branch this off then that's separate and then it's too short and it doesn't go with this other thing. So all of that, plays into it. But I, I think for the most part, once you're kind of in the flow, you'll see where, where it's supposed to land. Okay. Is that helpful at all? <laughs> no, absolutely. That that's great. I, I really appreciate that. Um, tell me about, doesn't have to be from this particular book, anything you've ever written. Tell me about one of your most interesting characters and what makes that character most interesting to you? What, what dynamics did you give it that make you feel like, okay, this is, this is the best character I've ever written. Oh, (laughs) the best character I've ever written. Um, that's, that's tough. I, it is, isn't it? I will say this. Um, so the, the little boy who is in my middle grade adventure book, he's the third member of the team. His name is Lanny. And He, I enjoy writing him more than any other character because wow. he's, he's smart. He's a little precocious. He's a third grader, but he's in the highly capable classes. Um, he's like always just kind of popping up. He's very, in, in, you know, enthusiastic and ready to go and wants to go on an adventure. And, um, and he'll sometimes say the things that my, so my main character, Jake, and this other girl, Jasmine, there's a little bit of this boy girl tension thing going okay. on. Yeah. And they're they're sixth graders and they are like trying to be a little, you know, more grown up. And meanwhile, Lanny will just come in and say the things that nobody else is willing to say. And so I enjoy the freedom to write that, to have him say something that kind of like breaks up everybody's, you know where they're like serious or intense or they're trying to be too cool or whatever. And he will take them out at the knees. So I okay. enjoy that. <laughs> okay. 
That actually sounds that, that sounds pretty interesting. I'm really starting to like this. It kind of <laughs> reminds me of like maybe like a smart like Harry Potter type kid or something yeah, like that. He, he's definitely he's he's smart. Um, he part of the reason why he wants to get um, he kind of invites himself on uh, Jake's investigations is because his parents have said you spend too much time indoors playing video games. We don't want you on video games. We want you outside and active. And yeah. so every Saturday he has to find something to go do. And so this gives him an opportunity to get, you know, to satisfy his mother who wants him to not be sitting in the house playing video games on a Saturday morning. Um, and so, yeah, he just, he's, I just really think he's funny. And then I, I wrote a whole bunch about his parents in book two. And, and my editor said, there's too many parents in this book. She's like, I like them too, but they got to go. <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? he, was, he had such great dad jokes. And, you know, so I enjoy that whole family, but. Okay. Can't Fantastic. always keep everybody. Right. If you could pick the brain of one of your favorite authors, who would it be and why them? Oh, that's a interesting question. Hmm. That's just, that's so tough. <laughs> that's a great question that I've never even considered before. Um, I get people with that one sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Me, I w he's still with us today, but I mean, I loved Goosebumps growing up, so I would love to sit and talk with R.L. Stein just about his thought process, you know? Right. Which is, which is how I kind of generated this question for everybody else. Right. Um, you know, huh, I would say... I would say probably somebody like a Beverly Cleary, somebody who, um, no, I'm going to, I'm going to change my answer. I'm going <laughs> to change my answer. And, and I don't even know if this counts because this isn't fiction, but it would be Irma okay. Bombeck because okay. Irma Bombeck, oh, she was a humorist. She wrote stories about her family and, um, she always reminded me of my grandmother too. But, um, I think I'd want to know like how, how did you forge this career in an era where women weren't doing anything? You had the audacity to say some things that didn't necessarily fit into society um, at the time. And, but she did it with such grace and humor that people were like, whoa, she just said something pretty shocking and outrageous, but it, it had a soft edge to it. So nobody got offended. And, okay. um, and the fact that she was able to write, about her family without, um, I mean, I wonder how her family felt about it. So I, yeah, I think right. just as a, as a writer, because she, she crafted stories, she used real life examples, but she crafted stories. I would just love to sit and spend an hour with her. Okay. Okay. That's a great answer. Well, it seems like we've had a great podcast. We're rounding off an hour here. So I only have an hour <laughs> recording time. So sorry, uh -huh. I'm chatty. Yep. I no, that's okay. It, it was one of the most fantastic podcasts I've had thus far, to be honest with you. Not yeah. anything against anybody else. They were all great too, but you had a lot of great information to bring to the table. And I really appreciate that. Um, do you want to just show people the cover of your book one more time and tell them where to get it from? Yes. So um, it's called it the is, Sasquatch of Hawthorne Elementary. Yes. Okay. Um, it Amazon, is, Barnes and Noble. It's available. Um, so it's not available in stores yet because it's technically not supposed to be released till January 18th, but you can right. buy it on Amazon. You can buy like it pre-order type deal. No, Amazon's still shipping them, but, um, oh, okay. Barnes and Noble is still sticking with the January 18th date. So if you pre-order from them, you won't get it till January. The other okay. thing I wanted to say is that my local bookstore uses something called bookshop.org to fulfill their orders. Um, okay. but there are a lot of times you can go on to your local bookstop bookshops website and they may not be fulfilling online orders, but they have a, a like a 
affiliate link to another one that'll give them credit. And I'm always big on supporting local bookstores, indie bookstores, because we need them to stay Indeed. around. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes. it just creates a dynamic for the town. I love when I go into a new town, like I move somewhere new, like, oh, look at that little bookshop. That place is awesome. Right. So, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kate. I'll have this spun down as soon as possible, and I'll ship this over to you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Andrew. Hey, thank you very much. I, I look forward to having you on again. Thank you. Me too. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.